Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Diversion Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. This is a special episode because born in the mothership is Melissa Ponzio. You know her as Melissa McCall on Teen Wolf. Now we discuss the upcoming Teen Wolf movie. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Ms. Ponzio. Thank you so much for coming to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's an absolute honor. You are fantastic. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of acting and who your earliest influences? Ooh, great question. Um, I guess my earliest, earliest influence was uh, one time I was on a family trip up in New York and I actually saw a movie being filmed on the street. Nice. And we were sitting at a, an outside restaurant kind of patio area. And in my child's mind, we were there for lunch. But my pop was like, we were there for six hours. I couldn't <laughs> get you away from that table. Um, and so that was like the first, first real memory of, gosh, what's that about? And who's moving all that around? And I want to be that. And that looks like fun with a big camera. And then, of course, I saw Sigourney Weaver as a young girl in Aliens. Mm -hmm. And um I remember as a little girl wanting to be that, wanting to be her, and then also wanting to be that, that big thing on the screen. Like, what's that about? And then as I got older, my mom was a model and an actress when she uh, lived in New York when she was younger. And I remember telling her that I had dreams and aspirations. And she was like, go get a degree. And I went and got a degree. And then she's like, go get a job and make money. And I did that. And then she's like, do you have enough for health insurance? And I'm like, mom are you saying all this because you don't believe in me? And she's like, no, 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 I believe in you. And it got to the point where um, I was actually working in news and I was acting at the same time and one of them had to give. And I was like, <laughs> well, I'm not going to be Maria Shriver. So let's just put that on the back burner and try this acting thing full time. And so I've been a full time actor since then. So do you remember what movie that was that you were watching when you were six out of curiosity? No, I don't. I'm going to have to ask my family because they might know. It was kind of like, it might as well have been car wash. You know what I mean? It was just like <laughs> some kind of low budget. I remember tank tops and like Terry shorts yeah. and roller skates. So it was definitely a little bit more cheesecake. We were down <laughs> Uh -oh. we were down in the village, the Greenwich Village. And so I just remember it was my first impression. And man, I might have been seven, but it was my first impression of a film set, what that yeah. really looked like. That is absolutely awesome. So I read that you actually graduated from Georgia State University with a bachelor's in journalism. That's right. Uh, Georgia State University, Panthers number one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I majored in journalism and minored in theater. Because again, you know, have to have a real job. And, uh, and I was very lucky. I actually worked for the CBS affiliate here in town in Atlanta for three and a half years. Uh, it was around the time, um, this was, might be before your time, but the Susan Smith trial here in town, the Olympics that happened here in town, the Olympic mm. bombing. So there was a lot of stuff that happened while I was there. But, uh, you know, my love for acting prevailed over anything else. Also, news is really hard. You have to be <laughs> smart. And I'm not that smart, dude. <laughs> Just not. I'm not. I'm allergic to responsibility and not that smart. A perfect job for an actor. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> so... When you thought of a backup, I guess your backup was in a way journal, though your minor was theater. What was your thinking about journals? Was it the, the creative aspect of it? Was like did you was it the investigative aspect? What was that aspect that you thought to yourself, this is the backup, I guess? Well, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, you you have that that dream that would that is just like bullshit dream so I thought that I was going to be an Olympic diver even though I had never dived before <laughs> and then my best friend um at the time she was going to journalism school and I was like well that sounds interesting maybe I can do that maybe it's maybe it's a bridge you know journalism mm. communication into film and theater and back in the day they didn't really have any I had to stay local I had to stay in Georgia and they didn't really have any 
um, magnanimous uh, film programs here. So Georgia State was something that was being provided and also real life work here in, in, in Georgia. So I was able to do commercials and corporate training videos and, you know, film and television very, very rarely because we didn't have a robust film market until um, many, many years later. But I was able to get my feet wet and I, and I knew that I loved it. And I knew that I would, I knew, this is what I knew. I knew that there was 12 girls ahead of me, right? In the category of whatever this is. And I'm, yeah. you know, this, this, what I present to the world. There were, there were 12 girls ahead of me when I started, but I knew that some of them would drop out. Some of them would get pregnant. Some of them would move to another state. And then I might be one of the top girls just by tenacity that I would be able to be sent out. Mm. And, and eventually that's what happened. You know, you, there's a certain level of, um, it's not a real word, but stick to I think, mm -hmm. in acting as you're learning and you're growing and, and you have to, you have to stick with it. Cause if, if, if you're not willing to stick with it, you lose traction. Now, I was, see, one of my, the questions I had following, but I think you may have answered it. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you if you did just answer it. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, is there a line from your career in journalism to your success as an actor? I was wondering, is it, First, my first thought was like your understanding of like words and writing and things of that nature, or is it the tenacity to be successful at it is what the the line is between that and your success as an actor? I would say a little bit of both. Thank you for picking up on that. And also there's a certain amount of deadline that you have with news, right? Mm. So you can't get nervous with news. You have to get prepared and you have to get prepared because there's breaking news. You have to get information. You have to, you have to digest that information. You have to be able to give it back to certain people in the newsroom has to be concise. Um, and I find that also um, sometimes specifically with auditions, you're getting at last minute. Mm. You have to have that character development, you know, before, during, and after, and all of these, it keeps you on your feet. So I feel like that's a skill that I applied from what I learned in journalism to acting. It's like be in the moment, go with the flow. Mm. Uh, what, what can I, what can I take away from this? You're not going to be able to take away the entire character description if you only have a couple hours with the audition, but you have to take enough of it to make some choices. And in news, you have to make choices and in acting, you have to make choices. And I mean, you mean a joke earlier about not being smart. However, the ability to absorb a script especially quickly and sometimes on a set too, the scripts are being changed at the, at that second must be an amazingly difficult task. So yes. how did you acquire that? I mean, is that because once again, it's because you have a felicity with words. How does that work? Well, good question. I think it's, you know, everybody has their process. Um, and it's kind of like an in ingredients in a cake, right? If we mm. were if we were all on a baking show, we all might get the same ingredients, but you might put a little bit more cinnamon in it, right? And so it's the same thing with a script. I'm looking at it and I'm making decisions uh, that might be a little bit more comedic in nature. You are looking at it and you're like, I see the drama in this and somebody else sees, you know, whatever they see in it. And so once I believe you start seeing the points that you want to pull out, that's kind of what crafts the backbone of, of what you're doing. And everybody has their own process of how they memorize or how they like to work the page or not. Or some people like to put on accents. Some people like to put on a hat. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just like to try to do my best to do the work so that they can see that I can do the work. Mm. That That's part of it too. Because at some point, just like with any other job in any other industry, when you're looking at a certain position, when you're looking at a certain role and all the people that you're looking at, there's that top 10% that can do, that can do the role that mm. can do the job, you know, at IBM or home Depot or wherever it is that you work. But then there's becomes the intangibles that you look at. Do they, what's their work ethic? Like, are they on time? You know uh, you know, who have they worked with before that I can talk with uh, you know, and, and, and it becomes, there's the, all these other things that I think that creatives look at in our, our industry that maybe uh, sway it one way or the other. It was kind of interesting. Um, my, the, the last in person I've inter interviewed was a acting teacher who wrote a book on acting. Oh, okay. And he, we had a discussion about the the role of risk taking in Ooh, acting. Yes. And it sounds like you're someone who is excelling at the risk factor of it. So kind of go into like how you approach that idea. Ooh, that's juicy. That's juicy. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that one. Uh, yeah, there is, there's just innately a certain amount of risk in acting, you know, because every day you're going on a job interview 
And every day you have to be a certain level of vulnerable. You know, you're not just hiding behind a resume. Mm. You actually have to go in and present yourself. And on some level, yes, you're doing a character, but also I'm standing in front of you. You're looking at me. You're making judgments about me and, and what I'm presenting. And so, you know, it's just a risk, I think, to walk into any room, what we do for our careers. Um, as far as taking risks, you know, those are like uh, the little choices that you make to, to stand out, to show the little bit of salt and pepper that maybe you can put on it. And sometimes you're really wrong. One time I was doing this audition, and I think the name of the project at the time was uh, The Travelers. And it was about, um, forgive me, um, this this family of, uh, you know, quote unquote, traveling gypsies that went around and kind of were conning people. Mm. And they were kind of like, um, you know, I don't want to use the wrong term, but they the uh, black Irish, meaning look, look more like me than, than yeah. the typical. So um, and I was like, oh, man, I am going to nail this accent first mistake. So, um, you know, I go and I try to learn this Irish accent or, you know, uh, for, um, you know, a 24 hour period. And I try it out at a, at a motel that I'm staying at. And they're like, are you from France? So already like the universe is telling me I'm not doing the accent. right? <laughs> so I go in, but I'm committed to it. You have to commit to your choices, right? You got to commit to the risk of it. Yeah. And so I was committed to this accent. And so I go and I do the first audition. I'm in the room with the director and the casting director and casting director was like, okay, well, they've been in the States for 150 years. And all of a sudden I just deflated. I was like, <laughs> wah, wah, wonk, 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 wonk. Uh, there goes my choice. And it was right. the biggest choice. And then as an actor, you've got to recoup. You just got to not even think about it and just go on to the next thing and say, yes, okay, accent gone. Now I'm presenting myself in a different way. But there's, there's, you know, there's risks if you do, and there's risks if you don't, mm. if that makes sense. Oh, it totally does. And like I said, I'm I'm often glad um, I'm not an actor because one, I'd be bad at it. And and two, the the challenge of the audition just seems overwhelming because on the one hand, like you, as you mentioned, you got to take that risk and do something that might be unique. But if you come out of your comfort zone too much, as you just mentioned, that's also could be a mistake. So that's a hard needle to thread, it sounds like. It is. It is. That's very insightful. Um. But, you know, it's also a muscle memory, you know, when you're looking at um, somebody like an athlete, you know, when you're talking about a, a, a basketball player that makes 10,000 free, throw, free throws or, um, you know, some like a bicyclist or somebody that, you know, has to have, you know, there's a particular skill that's involved with what other ath athleticism that they're doing. You have to do it over and over again. And that's kind of like auditioning. Mm -hmm. It becomes a, a muscle memory. Your memorization process becomes a muscle memory. Um, and, you know, and you, maybe you can hold that, uh, you know, that copy in your head for two hours or maybe it's two days, but um, we're, in, we're, we're, we're lucky to audition and we're lucky to audition so much that it becomes a part of our skill set. I think it's harder if you have one audition every six months mm. because then, boy, aren't you ramped up? You're like, I haven't had an audition in six months and this is, this is going to be the icing on the cake and I have to do really good and I have to wear this shirt. And then you're all of a sudden you're generating all these other things other than just the work. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to make a bad comparison here, but it sounds like something that I experienced um, some years ago. I used to do a uh, commission sales um, for different stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not the same as acting, but my thought was I learned or I've kind of figured out the more I seem to want to sell something, the less the person I was trying to sell wanted to buy it. That's and right. I'm, and I'm guessing that's the same issue with acting, which is a bizarre truth. <laughs> the more you want something, the less you're going to get it. <laughs> right. So the surefire way to get what you want is to get rid of the want. Right. <laughs> if, you ask, if you ask other actors, there's this strange Murphy's law that happens. It's always the audition that comes in late that you don't have time for. You can't take a shower. You're going to have to put it on uh, camera while you're driving the car. Uh, you know, it's, it's always the ones that you don't care about it you don't want it. Those are the auditions that you book because you're not, you're not asking for anything in that moment. You're right. not asking for the role. You're just delivering a gift. It, it must be an amazing skill to get yourself mentally almost in a, re, that level of relaxation where you find an indifference, like, like you, a desire, but like an indifferent desire. <laughs> right. So I find that to be this as an actor, you're given a script or you're giving you're given a particular scene and you work on that scene and you see it in your head and you know all the beats that you're going to do and you go in and you 
uh, perform that audition. The first time you perform it, it's yours, mm. right? Because I'm presenting this, this is what I have made. And then the second that somebody contributes something in the room, it's theirs. Mm. It's somebody yeah. else's. So, you know, you have to be, you have to be very passionate about what you're giving. And then you have to be kind of indifferent when, when you're actually getting direction and you have to take that direction and give it back and leave everything on the field. The best feeling that I have is when I walk out of a um, audition and I want to do it again. Mm. Like I feel lifted and energized. And I was like, oh, that's fun. That was so fun. Let me do it again. That's when I know that I've done my job as an actor. Now, since we've kind of recently gone through COVID, I assume a lot of the auditions now are all on camera. Is that helping you or hurting you? Because once again, you can edit, you can stop it and try it again at the same time you don't have that, you know, counter with the actual people who are there or, or even able to watch their reaction watching you. Self tapes are kind of the way of the world now. And I believe that it takes away a little bit of the, the performance dimension. And it also uh, allows us to be very lazy. Like we, are, I mean, the collective way. I can only speak for myself. There's a lot of times where I'm doing an audition and I might have my pajama bottoms on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't normally be doing that if I was walking into a casting director's office. Man, I'd be looking slick. I'd have on my boots, my special jeans. I would have taken a shower, you know. And so in all of that process, you know, you get to a certain level of performance. When you've got your pajama pants on, are you as much, are you as committed? Yeah, you're comfortable. So I, and also just being in front of somebody and really being able to get that energy of, mm. of what they're liking to be able to read the room. That's a little bit gone. You know, I'm lucky enough that I'm able to put myself tapes on with my partner, who's an actor as well, Kenny Alfonso. And, you know, and we're able to get each other going by way of energy wise and, and connectivity. Not everybody has that ability. Sometimes even you've got somebody on a phone and you're you're recording off your computer and, you know, it's you really have to use your imagination. Well, now that you're the Melissa Ponzio, I mean, it's got to become easier now to do these because once again you have this long successful career as as we're about to say you're Melissa McCall from Teen Wolf does that reputation help you now in what you're doing well you're very kind to say the Melissa Ponzio I'm the last Ponzio so I'm going to take that as a huge compliment and I'm gonna I'm gonna stand proud in it so thank you um no it never really it never really gets easier um you just you know, it, it, it breeds a bit of more confidence in the work because I, you know, I feel like I have had um, some validation from all the work that I've done on, on Teen Wolf and all the work that I've done on Chicago Fire and the fact that they keep asking me back or any actor back, that is the huge, biggest compliment because that's, we like you, the audience likes you, you know, um, they want you to come into their living room every night. And that is a huge thing when you're welcomed like that from a fan base. Um, but yeah, you know, you still, at the end of the day, we're still just actors trying to get the next gig, as mm. simple as that is. And we're committed to it. You know, we're committed to finding that next gig. And I, I even think, you know, even when I'm talking with people that have been on shows for a very long time, there's always the trepidation of this could stop at any moment. Mm. What's my next thing? How am I going to survive? Well, you're going to survive on the tens of millions of dollars that you got from your network show, you know, <laughs> uh, but that's not how we work. We're always looking for the next thing. Well, like I said, you're also extremely successful because, as we said earlier, you are Melissa McCall from Teen Wolf, uh, which was on for six seasons, over 100 episodes, which that's, I mean, that's not an easy do. I mean, once you get to 100 episodes, that's a pretty big deal. That's, that's success right there. Huge. So going back to, I think it was 2011 when the show first aired. How did you get involved with Teen Wolf and what interests you in the character of Melissa McCall? I was out in Los Angeles and I got a call from my best friend here in Atlanta. Her name is Tiffany. And she's like, hey, have you gone out for that uh, Teen Wolf uh, thing yet? And I said, uh, no, I don't know anything about it. She said, you look just like the kid. You look just like the kid. You gotta, you gotta get in on this. And she had auditioned. She was an actress, but she is Snow White to my Rose Red. We are completely different characters. So, you know, I made a couple calls and I was able to get in out in Los Angeles and I was able for them to call me back. And I tell this story freely. I get a call on a Thursday from my managers and they're like, hey, so uh, here's the deal. You're not the first choice, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the other actresses don't want to go to Atlanta to work. And I was happy to go to Atlanta because it was my hometown. Right, right. 
And they were like, well, don't worry about it. It's probably only two or three episodes with the parents. And then they'll write the parents off and the kids will rule the world. And that'll be it. Well, that obviously wasn't it. You know, we a hundred episodes strong and, you know, Jeff Davis was very, very kind and insightful to write the parents into what was going on in Beacon Hills to lift the curtain a little bit. So to be honest, I didn't even have Teen Wolf on my radar until my friend called me, my dear, dear friend called me. And then when I read the script, you know, I knew Teen Wolf from Teen Wolf, Teen Wolf, the movie, Michael right. J. Fox. And I was like, well, is this little ditty, how's this little ditty going to go on MTV? Because at the time when I read it, I was like, well, this is, this is Romeo and Juliet with werewolves. That's yeah. what my impression was darker though, darker than anything that I thought, you know, I had seen on MTV for sure. And so we were here shooting in Atlanta for that first season and they kind of left us to us own, our own devices, so to speak. And then when it premiered, holy cow, amazing, mm. amazing, amazing response, amazing feeling. We had no idea. Um, and, and to this day, uh, grateful for every moment, grateful for every person that's watched it. Grateful that we get another chance with the Teen Wolf movie coming up here in January. Um, it's, it's, it's a double dream come true to not only make a show for a hundred episodes, but then in some capacity to be asked back again, we're asking, we've been asked back to, to, to people that really enjoy what thousands of people have created. It's not just the actors. Mm. It's everybody that is boots on the ground. And I mean, the cool thing about Melissa McCall is that she's had a very impressive character arc over those six seasons. Now, how much of that was, told to you at the beginning like oh by the way this is where you're planned to go or was it kind of this is the next script it's the next script and eventually you figured it out that you, this is where you're headed um it was the second version of that it was much more you know jeff davis is our captain and i think that he he understood and he knew where where we could go not only through each season but all the seasons as a whole and so we were along for the ride you know um episode to episode um, and you're right, you know, all of our characters were written not to just, what does Jeff refer to it as? Um, take a meeting. Mm. When two people are in a room and they're just talking uh, as if we're taking a meeting. I mean, we were involved. We were yeah. out there. Um, all of our characters were. And we got we got a chance to do a, a lot of stuff, a lot of different situations. And it all contributed to, um, you know, this wonderful world of Beacon Hills and everything that that Im implies. Now, if... if um, if you had known the arc um, from the very beginning, were there any decisions you would have made differently or anything that from, you know, from the beginning to season six and as your character developed, or did it basically come out the way you, ex you kind of guessed the character was going to head in that direction? Good question. I think at the beginning of season four, I was lucky enough for, um, Jeff and the writers to to reach out and we talked about like what in in my opinion after going through all of those seasons like what would be next what mm -hmm. what could I see next for the character and I was very happy with where she was being written and how she was being written for but the two things that I that I said was would love to have more comedy I always love I always love slipping a little funny in there and then the other thing is they were asking about love interest at that point and I remember saying very clearly, does she need to end up with anybody? Like, why can't she just be a single parent working really hard for her son? Nobody says that, you, you know, at the, at the, you know, the fairy tale can just be, I'm here alone with my spaghetti in my house that I pay for. And that's a really good feeling, you know, right. um, they didn't necessarily take that as a suggestion, but um that might have been an interesting end, you know, all of these parents coming together for their children and not necessarily coming together for love or dalliances. But, you know, I'm I'm very happy to have had more boyfriends and more um, relationships on the show than any of the other girl characters. I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I think what everyone liked, loved most about your character, uh, Melissa McCall, is the relationship, the relationship, sorry, between the mother and and her son, uh, Scott. Mm -hmm. Um and obviously, for th those who don't know, I don't. I hope this is not a spoiler. He's the alpha. He becomes the alpha werewolf. He's obviously potentially quite dangerous. So, from a mother's perspective, where is how does she balance the potential fear with this 
what Scott could be with the love that she has for what she remembered him being? Well, I think that um, that is probably the definition of unconditional love. Mm. Also, she had an entire lifetime with her son to know who he was innately, what yep. his nature was innately. And just because there's another level to it now that he's a werewolf. Yes, that changes, I think, certain aspects of a person, but not your core. And I think that that's what was proven in, in the six seasons and the hundred episodes is that Scott had a core that resonated through any of the, any of the, um, any of the drama or any of the danger or caution or anger, you know, he still had something that he was pulling from that was innately good. Mm. And so I think, I hope that um, moms can feel that with their children. And so, yeah, I'm sure there was probably, if I really had to think about any particular instance, there probably was, uh, you know, caution, you know, because I remember when he was revealed, he revealed himself in season two, you know, Jeff kind of did write a scene where we were kind of between a it was, we were between a door. We were both on each sides of the door. And he was like, mom, you're going to have to talk with me sometime kind of thing. And I was kind of behind the door a little bit. So I think that, you know, in any relationship, when you drop a bomb like that, you have to give the other person a little bit of time to uh, process it. And I think that that was shown to to happen in the show. And, uh, you know, and then it was game on, like now we're on the same team. Now that, now that there are no secrets, now we, now we can work together. Now, another part that started interesting interesting about the relationship between once again um melissa and scott is the issue of protection obviously mm. um scott's goal is to protect the town from uh, bad werewolves and things of nature um melissa is once one kind of agrees with the idea of protecting the town but she's also the mother of this of scott where's the line between knowing what he needs to be doing and also the idea of concern about getting that the danger her son putting himself in trying to do this does she prefer him you know, not being involved and take the risk to the town or would she be like, or does she think to herself, this is what must be done hundred percent. I'm all in and helping him do this. I think it's, I think it's the latter. I think it's the more of the support, the mother's support. There was one time when I questioned if she should come at him really hard for making a decision, what I perceived as a bad decision. And Jeff was like, no, no, no. You're the unconditionally loving mother. You're always going to be there. You're always going to find a way through it. And so, um, and I, and I and I took that to heart. I was like, okay, well, then then that's that's the lane that I'm going to stay in. And so, so to answer your question, I think it's 100% support. It's 100%. I know what he's in his lane, and I'm in my lane. Mm. And you know, he'll come over and ask if 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 he needs more than what I'm giving him as a mom. And I think that's also uh, very interesting in a in a in a mother son dynamic in a yeah at the time a single mother and son dynamic because you're you know you want to raise your your kid to the ultimate strength mm. and uh, and i think that's really important and i think it's also great once again um she is a nurse which is inherently a job that you're protecting those who are hurt yeah is that a natural extension to her need to protect the town protect her son protect the pack Sure. Yeah. And people ask all the time, you know, would you want to be, you know, would you want to be something more, um, you know, supernatural? And I, and I always say, no, I, I like being human. I like being someone human that does extraordinary things, mm. you know, all, all of the parents. Well, I say all of the parents, you know, with, with Lyndon and, and JR and myself, the, the three mains, you know, to, to be human in these interactions, I think are really important. I think it brings a, a, a balance. And so, yeah, I think, and, you know, you want to talk about protection, all three of us protect in our own different ways and the way that we're able to contribute as parents and also what, what we're called to do as um, spirits, mm. as entities. And I think once again, the proof that the show and, and you have done such a great job is that, as you mentioned, there's the move, Teen Wolf movie coming in yeah. January. And the impressive thing is this isn't like the show just ended last year. And they're like, okay, let's do a movie. This has been about five years since it ended. Yes. So were you surprised when you were kind of like, hey, we're doing this. And what does that say about the quality of the show, the, the fan base, that five years later, the movie's coming? Listen, our fan base is the best. They're friends of the show and fans of the show and very, very loyal and um, supportive and loving and um, just it's it's just a beautiful community to be a part of. 
I had a feeling we did at the beginning of um, the lockdown, we did a Zoom reunion. And there was like, there, there seemed to be like a little bit of a spark. There seemed to be a little bit of a talk. You know, Jeff was saying there's other entities that are looking at it. And, and, um, and Tyler was like, yeah, I'd be up for it. And everybody was like very nodding, nodding. And I was like, ooh, 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 this could be really great. And there was um, a little bit of the rumorville during that time that w- just the collective we, what if we run out of programming? What if this lockdown is so long that we don't have fresh stuff? Yeah. And there were all these rumblings that I was hearing of, well, what we could do is we could get old casts back together and have a throwback, right? Because we know these people can work together. We know that there's a built-in audience. And so I was like, hmm, <laughs> that could apply to us. But really, I think it it really started germinating, what was that, a year ago, a year and a half ago? Y'all will have to keep me honest on that. You know, Tyler came on to Instagram and he was really pushing for the show. He was really pushing for like a second wind and and really behind it and really talking about it. And I was like, oh man, I hope somebody's listening. So when I got the call from, from Jeff, when he was like, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, but it looks like it's going to, it looks like it's going to happen. And it looks like we're going to come to Paramount plus. I was like, I'm not going to tell anybody. You think I'm going to bust this balloon? Uh Uh-uh friend. And so it was fingers crossed for a really long time. And then to get the second call, yeah, it's, it's happening. You know, will you be a part of the cast? And I had no illusions of when you have a hundred episodes, so many people, so many characters, so much story, so much richness to pull from. Um, I, I didn't know if I was going to be part of the movie and to not only be part of the movie, but to be a larger part of it, you know, um, it's just, uh, I'm just grateful every day. It's a, it's a real gift to be able to work with your friends again. Now there, there have been shows throughout TV history that, you know, go on maybe four or five seasons and over time are forgotten. They're, you know, not well remembered. Why has Teen Wolf endured so strong that a movie has been made where other shows over time just kind of fade? Good question. I guess that's, that's also an audience question. I don't believe that our show is like any other show on television. I believe that our our show one of the one of the great benefits of our show I always say is that our creative team not only in writing but also um, visually and all that you know all that uh, all that presents they're given a lot of leeway to come up with really creative shots really creative sets mm-hmm. um, really creative worlds and so I think that part of also when people go back and look at the show again you're seeing things. I think that weren't that you didn't maybe catch before when you look at our scenes, they're very rich. We used to say, you know, we're actually, we're shooting a television show, but really it feels like a, it feels like an independent film every week. I mean, there's a lot in there. There's a lot of story in there. Um, And so I wonder if that has something to do with it. Um, You know, Jeff was the creator of criminal minds. And so, you know, and he was a young writer and a young creator. And so he brought that um, youth into Teen Wolf, but also with a really solid story and mythology backbone. And I think that's really important with a show because you can't just willy nilly it. People will point it out. Right, right. If, if you get something wrong. And um, so far, he's got a pretty good batting average on that. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a nostalgia. There's also a beautiful thing where, and I hear this at conventions and I hear this from friends and fans of the show. Ah, oh, you know, I just started rewatching it with my sister or, oh, you know what? Mom and I started watching that or it's it's something that we do on Saturdays or it's something that, you know, I I have friends over in London and we'll we'll get on the computer and we'll watch it together. And so I feel like there's this beautiful introduction that original fans of the show have parlayed all of these years that have allowed us to now step into this movie. And what's great is that I believe, I hope this is true, that with the movie, People that watched the show will be satisfied with what happens, but also people that are just first coming to it will understand what the mythology is and the legacy Mm. and where these characters are going and will be satisfied with the movie as a whole as well. I I hope that both are satisfied. Well, I'm going to dip my toe a little bit potentially into spoilers, so welcome to wave me off if I'm off or just, you know, be vague with your answer. Um, Obviously, in in the real world, it's been five years since the show has ended. Now, within the movie, Mm -hmm. has it been five years since these characters have last been seen, or is it a a longer or shorter timetable? 
it's a longer time period. Okay. So we're meeting these characters in in new I don't want to say in new lives, but we there's some growth that is happening. So we're we're seeing them with new experiences, with with new successes, maybe new failures, maybe new relationships. And so enough time has passed where um you know, there's a lot of story to be told about that too, people coming back together. Mm. So from Melissa McCall, the, we, we don't know what, um, obviously as a fan, we don't know what happened during those intervening, intervening years. Um, how have you approached the character potentially differently or the same, given where you think the character now is or what you've been told has happened in the intervening years? Well, she owns the hospital now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hey, congratulations. Might as well. I mean, she <laughs> might as well. Um, I just thought about how much time had passed in real life and how much everyone had grown in the five years that we hadn't been together. And then I, then that was exponential with the time that has happened in in the movie. And so that's how I got prepared for it. I knew that I was going to be coming to set and I was going to be seeing my friends who have grown over the last four years or five years, however long it was. And so organically, I was going to see everybody different. Mm. Yeah, we see each other, you know, we see each other when we get, you know, when, if we get together or we see each other at conventions, but like enough time had passed where there was a lot of real life growth. And so I personally used that in my performance and also in myself. So- was it hard to connect, get that chemistry back, that spark back from the TV show? Or did it, was it just natural like instinct, like muscle memory just pop? It was right back in it. <laughs> and I don't know if other shows and other um, casts have this, but we were lucky enough to shoot on the stages out in Los Angeles. And so there were some sets that were still there. The hospital was still there. Sheriff Station was still there. The, the halls of Beacon Hills were still there. And so it was literally walking back on set as if, no time had passed. We joked that it felt like a fever dream. It's like, where are we right now? <laughs> um, and then we were able to work with some of the crew that was in Los Angeles and couldn't come out to Atlanta because we finished the, we did 30 days of principal photography here in, in Atlanta. And, you know, some of the crew came and, and worked on it as well. So it was this beautiful, it was this beautiful bookend of season one, actually one and two was filmed in Atlanta. And then we had all this in the middle. And now here we are coming back to Atlanta to do the Teen Wolf movie. And so it was, it was really wonderful. And, and everybody's, we're all friends. We're all a beautiful friend family. And so we were able to step back into that pretty easily. And um, it was just a joy. It really was. So what can our listeners and the fans look forward to in the movie? Like, can you give any like hints of what we're going to be excited about seeing? Ooh. Ooh. They did a really good job of incorporating as many characters as they could. Um, you know, there's a bit of past, present and future in it, which I think is hopeful, hopefully for a uh, Teen Wolf movie <laughs> part two, the second one, you know, <laughs> let's all hope, fingers crossed. Um, I, you know, I think that we, we've waited a long time for this. We've hoped a long time for this. And now that it's here, I hope people see it for what it is. It's just a huge gift to be able to come back and, and see everybody again and experience, you know, that magic of what Teen Wolf was. And and I hope that we captured it again. I really do. Which is kind of funny because I was about to ask you, is there, I know it's early to say, but does the movie have an ending that's going to suggest a sequel potentially? I think that, Every creator, no creator wants to close the door, right? Yeah. So there's always like a nugget. There's always, it, it's a self-contained entity, but also I think that there's a nugget and, and a way to move forward if we, the collective, we all want to. When I say that, I'm I'm including the fans and the friends of the show, you know, because let, let's talk about it. It's on Paramount+. Plus. There has to be a certain amount of audience. There has to be a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, a want for another one. And 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 I know that the cast and the crew is ready to do it. And hopefully, um, everybody else is is willing to want it so that we can do it. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely awesome. So, when you're ready to do the sequel, you coming back on the show and you can talk about it. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Let's put that into the universe. Yes. If everybody will tune in, um, January twenty sixth on Paramount Plus. And just, um, you know, enjoy. And I hope that everyone enjoys it, watching it as much as we did, filming it. And I hope that this is just sh shades of things to come. 
and I want to point out to my listeners, um, anyone watching this uh, this interview, early viewing numbers on streaming shows are what matters the most. So if you're going to watch, mm. watch immediately. That's, okay, that, I didn't know that. Thank yeah, you. It was um, it was an interview, um, not an interview, but um, I, I saw an interview of with Neil Gaiman talking about the Sandman mm -hmm. and talking about the potential for a sequel. And what he was saying was, and Netflix, and I imagine it's probably true for most. It's the early viewing numbers that tend to have the biggest push on whether something considered successful or not. Okay. So early viewing numbers, most important, guys, tune in the first day it comes out. <laughs> thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ponzo, it's been. Thank you. Absolute treat. Thank you so much for talking with me. Have a great night.